Well, welcome everybody. Appreciate you being here. This is a, uh, a really interesting time in history. We're talking about what CEOs need to know about AI. It was 27 years ago when I founded the Alliance of CEOs and the internet that was just starting to take off after Netscape went public. I was convinced there was an inflection point in history. And I am just as or even more convinced we're at that another inflection point that is going to change the way we live and work going forward. And uh, it's, so we're in amazing times. And I don't know anybody better to put some insights and to curate what it all might mean for us and what we might be thinking about and learning about uh, than our longtime Alliance Director, Jim Cook, one of the most experienced, talented, respected, and connected CFOs in Silicon Valley and beyond. And so with no further uh, ado from me, we're going to get right into it because there's an awful lot to, of content today to talk about. So Jim, take it away. Thanks, Paul. Thanks everybody for joining. This is going to be action packed. We have 60 minutes. I have three other CEOs uh, toward the end um, that I will introduce and do some demos. For those of you who know me, I tend to get really deep in my analysis. I've been researching all this probably like many of you since launch in November of 2022, but I went even deeper um, since around June or July when I started attending a bunch of conferences. And so what you're about to see here is really just context setting for the next 30 minutes, what, what, I, what we believe or what many of the experts believe AI is and what it isn't. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about creation versus accuracy as a paradox, but, but also a new computing platform how to get started and how to take actions with your company. I provided a bunch of links and resources. You really don't need to take screenshots. We'll be sending this uh, PowerPoint around. So just please listen, please queue up some questions, put them in chat. And then we're gonna leave some time for uh, demos and then maybe some group Q and A if we have time. So I'm gonna try to go pretty quick. Uh, really what you're gonna be looking at is just a curation and mashup of literally dozens of sources over dozens of weeks. I, my brain thinks in terms of best doves. So when I went to some of these conferences and I was blown away by some of these presentations, uh, I thought to myself immediately, other people need to hear this. So I'm glad to be here and share it with you. Uh, you're going to see, you know, I, I started thinking about what would I deliver in 30 or 40 minutes? It really is. Let's try to level everyone up to a common language, what gen AI is, what it isn't. Really provide you some specific tools and usage examples and really give you some ideas on how to dive in and action steps. So hopefully I've done all the work for you. I know many of you are probably doing the same work. You'll probably see something. You may have seen some of this stuff before. Maybe this is the first time you'll see it, but I think it's interesting. A uh, little caveat, it's pretty messy. Uh, I've sourced everything, but anything uh, color and professional, uh, um, I've gotten permission from the original uh, content owners to share this with you. Anything black and white is mine. I'm not a professional slide wear maker, not a professional presentation presentation person per se. Um, so it's messy, but I think it's informative. And there's an expiration date. Um, if those of you are tracking, it's been nine months and things are expiring almost daily. So I, I, in about six months, we're going to be looking back and say how quaint this little um, exercise was. Paul said it's an inflection point. I also believe it. I think many experts believe it. I'll let you read this. Uh, I love Andy Grove, 1998. I ran across this as doing this research. Um, and I remember reading this book, uh, a lot of uh, uh, only the paranoid survive. And I'm not gonna read it for you, but at the end of the day, I believe we're at an inflection point. And I think many people do too. That's what it looks like. If you choose the wrong horse, uh, you're likely to uh, be on the wrong horse. And the next big thing, we've seen several of them over to, over the time. Just as a reminder, ChatGPT, it only took five days to get to 1 million users. But in context, here's how much it took other popular apps that appeared um, during our history, uh, Netflix being three and a half years to reach one and a half million users, 1 million users. Uh, interesting context, things are going much faster. Uh, here's some more context. It took till 2001 until 50% of the pop of the, I believe this is the US population, might be worldwide, actually started uh, using the internet. Uh, but we've had the launch of AWS, 2006, four to six era. Here's something that just came in and I added to this deck two days ago, Monday, August 14th, screenshot from my laptop. It was from Bessemer's cloud computing. I thought it was amazing, but 
it just reverberates that 86% of cloud companies will have an AI feature by the end of the year. Many people are predicting this. I also think that you will see chat bots, chat, chat text spaces show up in products that you know and love. Uh, AI is going to be here. It's going to be in front of you. And so I think we all need to learn and get ready for it and get ready how to use it. Just a little uh, uh, context. I wrote this. I was just thinking. I was remember being in front of a PC in 1980, blank screen, blank keyboard. And I asked myself, I think many of us asked ourselves, what can we do with it? 1990s, we were presented with the internet. Hey, we have all the data in the world at our fingertips in our browser. Pretty awesome. But how do I use it? And what do I do with it? How do I search for it? Uh, 2000, Google came along. They were the 18th search engine, as people might recall. There was a lot of, there was 17 other search engines before Google. Hey, it was great. I got a blank box on a blank white screen called a browser. And I know I have access to the internet, but what do I put in that box? Pretty similar to what we're asking ourselves with chat GPT today. Back then we had to learn keyword searches. 2010s, we're talking, we went to mobile and we went from uh, data centers uh, locked behind cages to everything being in the cloud. And that was the behavior change. And that was really a platform change. And now AI really is creating everything. But the question many people are asking, how do I start using it? And the words prompting and prompt engineering, we'll, we'll be talking about those later today. Mackenzie uh, said it this way, in the 2000s, machine learning has been going on since the 2000s, but really, really deep learning has been going on since the 2010s. And generative AI has really started coming in in 2020s. The way we define the, the way McKinsey defined this was, you know, machine learning was machines learning from each other, really analyzing, predicting. This is the AI, AI that many of us know today. Uh, deep learning really started to come into play with vision, Siri, Alexa, speech, trying to talk to the computer. Generative AI is, is really the, the language phase of all this. Uh, and it's, and so that's just some context on machine learning. If you hear those, that language, deep learning and really generative AI and how they're different. This gentleman I met at a June 4th conference from the Operators Guild, he blew the entire audience away. He's very understated, but amazing uh, intellectual techno technologist, dates back with uh, Mitch Kapoor in uh, Lotus 1, 2, 3. Uh, and he stood up there and gave us some of these slides of the history of artificial intelligence. And this is these some of these slides I really want to, uh, I'm excited to share with all of you. And really, it really, his history in his mind began in 2015 with what he's doing with artificial intelligence. So the screen goes this way from 2015, 2020, and then wraps around 2022. This is November of 2022 when everything, when OpenAI launched their uh, chat GPT. Microsoft pours in 10 billion to OpenAI in January, and he stopped this at February, but it keeps going. He really taught us about and reminded us that computational capacity is the reason why we're here, why why this is happening. And I had to remind myself what a gigaflop was, 10th to the ninth floating point operation per second. He put this on the screen, but this is the reason why this is happening is because of our computational capacity. From in this this slide simply shows 1993 to 2022, and, and it's almost going exponential. But the slide that really blew me away was this one. So I'm going to spend a little more time on this one. And he talks about, uh, we haven't had the ability to do this up until two or three years ago. And when we talk about Grace Hopper, it's a chip from NVIDIA. And Grace Hopper, when he announced, when he had the slide on the screen on June 4th, what was announced but not let yet released yet. Jensen Huang, I'm going to show you on the next slide, released it last week. But there are 80 billion transistors on a Grace Hopper chip, which is a CPU plus a GPU. And for context, the, the bold at the bottom, Apple's M1 MacBook chip has 16 billion transistors. By Q4, Yobi Benjamin was saying we're going to have 2.5 trillion transistors per chip capable. And if we just think about this, we, we, many of us grew up in Moore's Law and the chips uh, were, doubling in, were doubling in size and having in price. My first thought was Moore's Law is dead. We have way more computational capacity um, really than we need at this point, but we've really been hamstrung by our computational capacity, which really is no longer. When he, when Yobi says that we have the capability of doing almost 2000 terabytes on flash storage, NAND storage, blew my mind, um, but he showed us some examples. And then the bandwidth that's coming, we can do not 
300 terabits per second um, coming. If you think about this, you know, the physical infrastructure is no longer the limit. And you know, many of us grew up on 56K modems, uh, ISDN lines of 1.5 megabits per second. When you think we have the bandwidth, the storage, and the transistors, it's, it's phenomenal to think about uh, the bottlenecks that are going to be taken away. Here he did, he said, you know, the, the Holy Grail is 10 to the 50th um, uh, flops, which is an exaflop. I didn't even know what that was, uh, circled at the bottom. It's um, 10 with 50 zeros behind it. This is how many floating point operations per second can be done. On the right is the graph on how um, Moore's law has progressed. Uh, but now with NVIDIA's infrastructure and the ability to combine CPUs with GPUs, it really is going exponential. There, there. I pulled this on August eighth. Uh, this is this was the day before the first session last Wednesday. That's Jensen Wang, Wang uh, sitting in front of a visual representation of what they built as an experiment, which is two hundred and fifty six Grace Hopper two hundreds strung together. He was talking about how you can string two Grace Hoppers together, uh, which is a CPU and a GPU. These Grace Hoppers are big. And they have got a bridge unit that they can make two grace hoppers uh, to the computer seem like one. So then it let's put 16 of these in a rack. Let's put 16 racks together. This has the capability of doing an exaflop, 10 to the 50th uh, floating point operations per second. Um, it, we are at the beginning of s some amazing computational power. Here's the current universe of players. Microsoft, NVIDIA, Google, as you know, but there's many others, right? Um, and so you're going to be hearing lots about these names. Um, down at the bottom right is Hugging Face. It's a it's a company that is almost the Facebook of the 2020s that is trying to bring all this together. Meta just uh, Meta um, launched quite recently and open source their Llama 2, which has a lot of capabilities um, to put your own large language model in. But there's a lot of players. At the end of the day, uh, at least in June, you'll be thought that Google and Microsoft are going to be the apex players. It takes a lot of money to run these uh, to to run these large language models, especially if you have this much data. Uh, Microsoft, uh, Google's really trying to come out swinging hard with Bard, which is their version. Microsoft and their Copilot, and they're uh, deep with OpenAI. Uh, Apple has jumped in, and they have said that they are going all in on AI and and um, every single team at Amazon is now working at AI, says Amazon. And Tim says, we're going to build AI into every product. So, you know, is it a hype cycle? Many people are saying, oh, it's just another hype cycle. It's just another, you know, blockchain, Web3, you know, it's a hype cycle. Uh, I'm just introducing you some concepts that, that I think this is more real than past hype cycles. And it definitely is more accessible. And I'm hopefully going to prove some of that to you. And in the next few screens, and certainly the CEOs that are going to demo to you are going to tell you their stories about their journey of, of building AI into their products. Intel's trying to make a big comeback. NVIDIA is eating their lunch. But uh, Pat Gelsinger is saying, you know, we're going to build AI into every product. So when you got this many companies throwing th these many dollars and this much activity to AI, you know it's real and you know it's coming. Microsoft just, was this yesterday? Yeah, this was yesterday or Tuesday, August 15th. That was yesterday. Um, Taylor's it's chat GPT, chat GPT for business with Azure. Now what they're doing here, the strategy here is uh, to address the concerns of privacy. So they're going to allow you to, of course, work on their Azure cloud computing platform. Of course, use their version of open AI with their chat GPT, but they're going to ensure you that it's private, it's behind a firewall and you can put your own data in there. So everyone's going after a piece of this pie for sure. This is a demo and I'm just going to show it to you really fast. And he, Yobi Benjamin showed this on screen. There's no sound, but this is Microsoft's co-pilot. Bottom right, you're seeing somebody type in, please analyze this data for me. And everything that's showing up in the, the right margin is really a chat GPT version of uh, Microsoft co-pilot doing your spreadsheet for you. So you ask it a question in the bottom right, or you talk to it, say, help me visualize, you know, what contributed to the data. And all of a sudden, the computer is doing the work for you. This has only been accessible to about 600 companies right now, but Microsoft is going to launch this as early as late Q4. And I just wanted to show this to you. So it's not just talking about it, but here we see um, Microsoft Copilot creating an actual model, color coding it for you. 
the user saying, could you rearrange the data differently? All of a sudden, the spreadsheet's being created for you. You are talking to the computer. It, it was, it's pretty amazing. This is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, there was another great uh, presentation I, I got from Anand Mahakar. Um, he's a colleague. And I just wanted to share you a few slides with him. He's, um, he's from Findability Sciences. And he was really talking to us about the, the difference between discriminative AI versus generative AI. Everything we've been talked about is, is generative AI or that we've been talking about recently. Discriminative is really what's been going on for the last 10 or 15 years. And it's about predictive and, and learning, learning models. Generative AI is learning about patterns of unstructured content. And he goes on to say, you know, how did we get here? We got here through machine learning, through supervised machine learning and unsupervised machine learning. And just a few quick bullets on what supervised machine learning is. You know, and that's model training where you know the target, you have structured data. There are several, several CPU and GPU cycles that are training the algorithm. This is what we've known for a while. Unsupervised AL is ML, machine learning, machines trying to learn from each other. You don't really know what you're looking for. Unstructured data, web, social, text, language. Trying to create patterns out of This is where we are today, trying to make meaning of the data. This has been going on for a while. But deep learning is another... Ooh, I didn't take that out, those, those things out. Deep learning is really where um, un supervised machine learning and unsupervised machine learning are combined, where your algorithm is trying to learn from the unstructured data. And the combination of deep learning plus natural language processing is bringing us Gen AI, again, because of computational power. We're going to we're going to be able to, Gen AI is now being able to create new content and we're able to do it through actually talking to the computer differently. So we're going to talk about this um, for a while. The use cases, um, really, you've seen many of these in language. It's chatbots, which are obviously uh, the first killer app, note taking, general writing. You can write sales emails, marketing content emails. It's now creating code. So Microsoft uh, or, or GitHub Copilot you can literally talk to GitHub and, and it can come extract at least 80% of the code for you and do web app code, code documents, image and video. There's several apps out there doing videos and images and animation and video editing. Like the sky is the limit here. If you have data and you can process it, um, this is what it's all about. There's a new buzzword. Many of you have heard it. Um, I'm sure many of you know this word. It's large language models, LLMs. It's really a, a model that's been trained on a large amount of data, period. But LLMs, the pros of LLMs, as um, Anand was talking to us about, was, yeah, it can understand and generate text that's remarkably human-like. And the, and the cons are uh, the computational resources it takes. Cons are it's unpredictable. We've seen that LLMs can hallucinate. Um, and we'll talk about that later. It makes up data at times. Right. And so large language models are good, but they're not necessarily accurate. And it's going to need a human in the loop to actually ensure that it's accurate, that what you're getting is accurate. I'm not sure at this point and probably for a while, you're going to want to rely on the output of LLMs as accurate. It's great at generating content. It's great at starting a draft for you, but please don't rely on it as being totally accurate. Here's something I took from a Forbes magazine article. I'm a biology minor. I'll let everybody who's a fast reader just read a few of these boxes. But it really got me when it said, we can point these large language models at the language of life. These computers don't care what language you're giving it to. And the language of life is a DNA sequence. Language of life is you know, a bunch of protein sequences our, our biotech um, fellow brethren, um, CEOs have been working on. Let's just give it all the data and have the computer start figuring out how to cure cancer, how to fold proteins. Some of these experts are getting blown away now that we have the computational power at what could be possible with a large language model pointed at really, really hard problems. And I think many people are saying they're super optimistic about the discoveries that are going to be made just in the biotech and the biology world in the next few years. My slide again, contrary to popular belief, AI really doesn't know what words mean. 
they don't know what a sentence means. All it is is a pattern predictor. It's it's massive computations that it's predicting the next word after a certain word that you put in. It's predicting a sentence 97% of the time, the sentence comes after. What you're seeing on the screen is really just a computer predicting the next word, the next structure of sentences. It's not really thinking. It's not, it's, it's, it's not uh, alive. It's, it's no more live than your TV set or your smartphone. And it's like playing a logistic chess computer. It's going to win. It's going to probably write something pretty darn good. And people are saying, wow, that was amazing because it just is doing it objectively. And it's giving you something that's probably 80% um, pretty darn good. What Gen AI is and isn't, this is kind of how I thought about it. It's a great supercomputer pattern matcher. It's your new agent for the internet. If you want to play with those words, AI, or maybe your new assistant for information really, really faster and better than humans at creation and creativity. It does require a bunch of historical data. It doesn't work on new data. It requires massive compute energy, but it's only about 80%, right? But it's magnitude faster at learning something than a human. Humans are designed over millions of years with their DNA to react quickly, fight or flight syndrome. You know, a neural network that takes all five senses and can react to a baseball being pitched at you at 90 miles, 100 miles an hour and have you swing a bat within milliseconds. We're really good at that. Creating, trying to create something with a blank piece of paper and from scratch, a lot harder for us to do. It takes a lot longer. So now we're in the next several years, we're going to have this intersection of the computer probably starting creating something from scratch for us based on some ideas that we have and give us the starting point while we finish the starting point. So humans and AI are going to be in the loop. Uh, it's not going to be 100% computers, nor should it be. And, it, and, and humans need to learn how to use a computer to really go faster. AI is not intelligent, in my opinion, because of everything I've talked about. It's not artificial, and it's really not accurate, and, or at least not yet. Um, Human, the human brain is a true neural network. We only use like 12 watts per hour or 150 watts per hour. It doesn't take us much. And AI can't comprehend emotion. So I just want to set that stage on what it is, what it isn't. It's a super tool for sure. And so I think my call to action for everybody here, uh, and in case you've been on the fence, should I jump in? Should I not jump in? I would say jump in. Jump in because we need to learn to talk to a computer differently. Just like we learned how to talk to a Google search bar, you know, way back when. Um, we have to learn now how to prompt the computer. And we now have to learn how to teach the computer what we want and iterate. We're going to be doing several iterations to get the results that we need. Three key takeaways, and I'm going to jump into showing you how to do some prompts. But this this was a morph of what I heard Jensen Wang talking about. And I'm starting to really come around to believe it. A large like there's three key takeaways really here. Large language models are a new significant computing platform, and it's probably here to stay. An example would be some of the examples I put on the screen. When Windows came and overtook DOS, or when the iOS platform to do mobile, a browser is a platform, a smartphone is a platform, AWS is a platform, blockchain is a platform. These are super platforms, significant platforms. Large language models are a new computing platform, and it works, and it's easy to easily accessible. But you are the new programming language. Unlike all those other platforms where we had to learn something, maybe we had to turn to our computer science developers uh, or our data scientists and understand how Python or C++ worked. You're not going to have to do that. This is going to democratize computer science, in my view, in which if you can talk to the computer and prompt it, it will return results and you can train it through just different prompts. And the first killer app under every killer app, generative AI, is ChatGPT. It was launched November of 2022, and that's what's gotten everybody excited. But there's a lot more apps coming down. So it's super tool. First killer app is like Excel for the PC uh, or like the browser for the internet. ChatGPT is definitely the first, but it won't be the last. But really, it's time to learn it. It's time to dig into it. I think it's here to stay, and it's going to change how we work. So how do you get started? And I, like I said, we can... We can send this around later. Um, we will send this around later, but I found this cheat sheet on the net, really talking about key terms. I'm not going to go through it all. You know, how to how to frame your prompt, what kind of modes you need to talk to the computer about, example prompts, 
key use cases. And just quickly, you know, if you want to brainstorm something or, or write something or code something, um, GPT 3.5 and 4 is a great place to start. Give it a shot. If you want to, um, you want, you really, now you have to tell it who it is, who the, you have to tell the computer who it is. You have to tell the computer um, what actions you want it to take. You know, I want you to be my thought partner. I want you to be my critic. The computer doesn't care, right? You can yell at the computer, say, no, you're wrong, right? Again, the computer doesn't care. You can criticize it and say, you know, no, make it better. No, this is terrible. Um, you can have fun with it. So feel free. Uh, I found this the other day guide, you know, it's a good, uh, mnemonic to remember G U I D E when you're talking to the computer, give it a goal, tell it who you are user. You, you are a five to 12 year old kid, or you are a PhD. It'll give you different results. Give it, you know, instructions, give it some details about the instructions and examples. The more that you guide the computer, the better results you'll get some examples. It's super fuzzy because I took screenshots of that past uh, that past prompt. But you know, write five subject lines I would I should use for a holiday sale. I think many of you may have seen these or are starting to land on these. But this is the way you need to write to a computer now, not just a keyword. If I take number five, you know, I'm hiring for a part time baker. Draft me a job description using what you know about my business. ChatGPT is going to say, "What's your business?" If you haven't told it what it is, well, I'm a baker. I guess I'm a part time baker, but, or make it look like this or make it better. Here's an example. Um, and it does a really darn good job if you prompt it right. So just start experimenting with it. Here's how this gentleman did it on Twitter. Um, just to give you an example, I'm not going to go through it all, but uh, you can review it when we send the, when the, uh, this deck around. And it was just really helpful for me to see someone else actually writing it and showing pictures of writing it. So that's why I wanted to share it with you. You know, number six, create a learning plan. Number seven, easily understand everything. Can you explain the concept of whatever topic is in simple terms? This is how you're talking to the computer. And it's going to be uh, giving you results, which is pretty cool. Uh, if you're an iPhone user, go download this app, ChatGPT. Right? There's many apps out there, but this is a new one, um, official app by OpenAI. And you can actually literally start talking to the computer this way. So give it a shot. You know, Part of this is just about using it and learning it. This is so. This, these are so early days that you just have to be engaged and start doing it. Here's some example websites. You know, you can chat with any PDF now. Pretty remarkable. You know, we think of PDFs as static language, and many of us have PDFs that we save, but now you can upload them to ChatGPT and start asking it questions about what's in the PDF. Pretty darn cool once you think about it. You can generate voices. Um, pretty scary because now we're going to start having some voice phishing going on, and, and I can make myself sound like Paul, actually. Um, just by getting, you know, a sample of his voice. So, you know, with every power comes a little bit of, of danger, but these tools are available. Uh, which tool do I use? You know, for internet tasks, uh, this, these people were saying that BARD is better writing tasks, open AI is better or coding. If you're doing analyzing long PDFs, there's Claude, which is from Anthropic. So you're going to hear a lot of these names, um, but just be curious. And if you have your own data, Right now, it's looking like Llama 2 from Facebook and Meta is a really good, quote, open source alternative, even though there's a debate um, for those of us who are diehard open source people that it's not really open source. It kind of is. But regardless, there, there are open source large language models that you can dump your own data into and get the results back. You know, will AI take my job? So the, the short answer is, Yes, it will take some jobs, but it will actually enhance others' jobs and it will make others uh, much more productive. I think the AI is going to be the new coworker, is going to be your new outsource partner. And uh, it, I think humans and computers will be working together even more than we have in the past. And it'll be almost like our outsourced executive assistant, uh, if you will. Uh, I'm not going to go through a lot of this because I really want to get to our CEOs who are standing by. Um, but this is just some data on what people think that uh, the most occupations are exposed by. When it comes to developers, um, this is some data that it really saved 35 to 50% time just starting to use generative AI on coding tasks. Um, that was pretty eye-opening to me on how to do code documentation, actual generation, high complexity tasks and refactoring. And they, they liked using it. So not only did it save them time, but they actually enjoyed using it because it took all the 
hard parts about trying to create brand new code away so they can actually start refining the code. This is, I think, from that McKinsey article. Purple is, these are the jobs that have high potential for AI to automate. Green is potential for augmentation. Pink is lower potential. And purple is, it's probably not going to be automated. And this is by industry on the first slide and by jobs on the second slide. So it'll just give you some context on which jobs may be impacted, but they're not going away. It's just, we're gonna make them more efficient is really the bottom line here. And humans are going to be much more efficient in their tasks. Not going to go through this, but here's some examples of marketing and sales operations, IT, what you can actually do with it, what you should be thinking about doing with it. And another McKinsey, I really want to get to these demos. So I'm going to go quickly here. Maybe some action steps for your developer org, you know, provide your development leaders and staff with AI training and tools, require prompt engineering training for all staff, maybe bring somebody in house or maybe do some training in house. Have your engineering team who are really, really curious, share their best ofs every week. Maybe call a meeting every week and say, what did I learn today? This is changing literally weekly and daily. And maybe for a while you want to have some stand-ups and just, or some brown bags and say over lunch, hey, what have we learned? Um, allow your creatives in your org to teach everybody else. This is what I really would encourage many of you just to dive in and engage and have a conversation about what it can and can't do and find out for yourself. But really, when you're at an inflection point, my view is you got to determine where you're playing, who you should follow, what actions you should take, what is your competition doing? Can I use this technology to build a better moat, right? A better moat for my business. But at the end of the day, you have to point this technology at your customer and make it easier for a customer. So this is all just technology, but if it doesn't re reside, with you, reside with your customer, that it's not going to work. So always come at it from a customer backwards standpoint, in my view. So this came out the other day, Google Docs. There, you're going to start seeing this integrate with Google Docs. You simply say, help me write. And this is going to start popping up as soon as it's released into your browser, you know, a recipe. And all of a sudden, it's going to start asking you uh, or providing you with some text and asking you to rephrase it, elaborate it. You're going to start seeing this daily. This gentleman uh, told uh, ChatGPT to recreate the app that you see in this screenshot. He literally created an iPhone app in four minutes. It's pretty incredible, right? And GPT was creating the code for the app. And actually, through a series of prompts, he walks through on Twitter how he created this app just from a screenshot. Pretty incredible. But it, this is out there and it's happening today. Um, I'm not going to go through this, but you guys can click this video um, when you get this. This is from Wix. And it shows you how Wix is telling their customers how you can literally create a website simply by using ChatGPT. Uh, it's this is happening today, and I'm going to skip that. This is uh, Midjourney. They're doing the same thing with movies. They're they're saying create me a cool movie. Um, I don't know how long this this video is. It's probably 49 seconds. We'll do this. I don't know if you can hear this, but this was all created on mid journey, right? This is all artificial intelligence and people were quite interested. This created quite a stir just by talking to the computer. They created this movie. It would take a lot. This is just a trailer. I wouldn't say a movie. It's a trailer to a movie. Now everybody actually wants to see this movie get made. This was like a two-minute trailer. Uh, so here are your sources. Here's your reading. Uh, there's a lot of reading. This is where I took many of my sources from. So I provided the links. Uh, many people were on Twitter, Microsoft Copilot, Google, of course. Just dig in. And uh, with that, welcome Katrina, known as Kat uh, from Veretto. She's the founder and CEO now, or did you turn the CEO over? I think you're founder and CEO, right? I'm, I'm going to be the CEO for the next two decades. There's a good. lot to do. Good, good, good. Anyways, why don't you give us your journey on from November 22nd to now, and just give us a quick, maybe three to five minutes of what, what's happened with you. And if you want to share your screen, take it over, that's fine. Um, but I'll turn it over to you. Right. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, appreciate it. Great to see all of you on this call. I think a lot of examples were already given about AI. 
I'm going to focus a little on the, the finance and executive kind of side of that. So a little bit first about my background, and then I will share my screen. I, um, I have a product and data science background, but at one point, the now CFO of, of Meta, of Facebook, invited me into finance to build a technical team and actually to use what were some of the earlier precursors of AI. We built machine learning forecasting models, did a lot of automation, really like helped the company run better. And so fast forward to now when there's chat GPT, there's open AI, there's like such an explosion of open source LLMs, there is so much excitement. And on one hand, a lot of that is not new. Machine learning and AI have been around for a while. But on the other hand, now we're just seeing this like inflection point of everything that is possible. And my company, Veretto, has just really turbocharged what we can do for, for finance and executive teams with AI. So with that, uh, let me know if you can all see my screen. Perfect. Some thumbs up. All right, perfect. So I want to take you through an end-to-end -end example of how we can use AI to answer a basic business question, get to a decision, and most importantly, how does AI and human decision-making interact? So let's, let's start with basic question, how's our business doing? The question we're all asking ourselves every day and that we want to make decisions based off of. Before uh, a tool like Moretto, which powers automation and AI for finance and executive teams, it would be a nightmare days, weeks of pulling together numbers and spreadsheets with Veretto, here's something that we are actually, much of what I'm showing you, we are actually able to do today. And then the things that we can't do today are on our roadmap for the next few months. So very- Kat, just like, quick interruption. How yeah. long did it take you from when your team said, let's do this to when you got some sort of prototype up? Because that was stunned me. It was very quick. And I want to yes. hear your answer. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, a lot of what I'm showing you here, like parts of the, I mean, parts of the product we've been building, honestly, not for too long, but we're a three-year-old company. The AI, I mean, getting a prototype together, we worked super fast. Uh, it took weeks. And I think that's what Jim is alluding to. It is very, very easy for someone to slap some marketing on their website and claim that they have AI features and even integrating with open AI and actually trying to demo something is not that much work. The real work lies in getting some of the details right when it comes to accuracy, when it comes to how is this going to work with permissions and with hundreds of users. And so that's kind of the part that I'll, I'll point out to you here because it's magical, but it can also be dangerous if if not uh, if you don't fully think things through. And so here's an example where Veretto allows you to build models and reports. But using AI, you can just build these things so much faster. You can use natural language to say, show me an income statement for the past three months. Here it is. Um, you can build tables like this already, row by row, column by column, fully automated with integrations today in Veretto. The new thing with, with AI is using natural language, like AI is order taker to get this done. Here's another example, add on the board plan, show me the variance. Here it is. Again, AI is order taker. Here's one of the first features that we're going to be testing with our customers in the next few weeks, automated financial summaries. Every one of our customers, every finance team hates the financial summaries. Like, like we, we pull in data, we allow you to drill down, but actually writing the summary and like doing the work, writing the summary, we're about to automate that. Our customers are very excited. Um, but here's the part that maybe AI can't or shouldn't automate. AI can write the summary, but a human being still has to go in and analyze like, okay, we know we spent more on LinkedIn ads but why did we do that? Like, why did a human make that decision? And so we already have chat functionality in Veretto, all your favorite collaboration features. And this is where finance and let's say marketing can have a discussion. Like, well, we spent more because the cost per lead was lower. We thought it was good return on ad spend. And now back to AI, let's do some analysis. We, we think that there's good return here. Should we have bigger budget? Let's ask AI. And so this is where we can ask AI some questions. Did this result in extra revenue? Show me some scenarios. So like here's some scenarios, high scenario, board plan, low scenario. Here are the inputs. Here are the outputs. We can ask for sensitivity analysis. Show me some, you know, different for different advertising budgets and different costs per lead. What does return on ad spend look like? AI is very, very helpful at speeding up this natural analysis process so that instead of asking your um, FPNA analyst to run a bunch of things and then they go away for three days and come back, you can ask all of this in real time. You can get results in real time 
And then again, you can come back to marketing and uh, say, hey, you know what? Maybe we should be spending more money because the, the ROI is there. Marketing is happy. Everything is great. Um, so again, just to summarize, this is a really kind of powerful example of something that normally would take possibly days to get to a decision like this. And now with the help of automation and AI, people, our customers are actually having these types of decisions between finance and various business stakeholders all the time, speeding up the process of actually running their company. Uh, let me let me know, Jim, if you uh, if you want to have Q and A, or we could pass it on. To we'll Andrew. do that. Yeah, we're going to pass that on to Andrew. So Perfect. Andrew at Clarity Law. I hope you're on here. I'm pretty sure I saw you on here. Hey, Jim. Hey, everyone. Yes, I'm on. Andrew, we met uh, we met about a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago. And I think the reason I wanted you to come and and talk to this crew was because when I attended your conference um, and I heard about your sabbatical. And you and the founders, you're the founder of this company, and and um, and when you and the founders saw this thing launch in November 2022, you took the radical um, step to say, okay, we're going to stop and go on a, what was it, a three-week sabbatical, three-month sabbatical? Why don't you tell us the story? And then bring us to the common date, day of how you've integrated this into your product. Yeah, absolutely. Well, hi, everyone. I'm Andrew. I'm the co-founder and CEO of a company called Clarity. And basically what we've built is an AI system that can automate what you would typically offshore. Um, so our customers use us to literally automate the way, you know, human bodies uh, that would be doing highly repetitive work. So think about us as, you know, competing with the cognizance, the Accentures of the world and saying, instead of using thousand people to do this order form PO matching work or revenue recognition or lease accounting work, you can actually use AI um, to, to automate the same process. Um, we are, we, we hit an interesting journey. It's rather than building a product with a little bit of, uh, you know, AI in it, we have set to build AI and then we built product around it. So we started a, an AI company in 2016, which turns out to be about six years too early. Um, and basically what we started with is we said, we're gonna build an engine that can automatically understand documents to the same degree as a human, and then build the software around it that can actually automate the entire workflow. And so, you know, during all the years, we have our own NVIDIA rigs in the office still, we've trained our own models and so on. But what became really clear about a year ago um, was that we will not have to do that anymore. Um, that large language models coming out of OpenAI, who's a customer of ours, by the way, uh, coming out of Google, who's also a customer of ours, um, are so powerful that we can, we don't have to be training our own models. We don't have to be building things from scratch, as well as we can introduce a ton of new features. And so what we ended up doing is when we get a whiff of GPT 3.5, we went and we said, we're going to do a one month long sabbatical, and we're just going to learn absolutely everything there is. We're going to try it at ourselves. We're going to build a benchmarking uh, tool that will help us understand how well certain models perform versus other models in a, in a consistent way. Um, and we took the, our entire machine learning team on that journey with us. Um, in two weeks, uh, we've done all the work that we set out to do for, for the entire month. So we cut our sabbatical short um, and we've incorporated um, Gen AI, a couple of different large language models into our product uh, within basically about two months. Uh, we have launched, we were the first company in the world that launched the GPT-4 demo. We have incorporated it in four hours uh, from the launch. So I think that gives you a sense for how easy it is to actually incorporate some of these models into your product um, and just launched it. And then saw, you know, the, the traffic and saw people uh, testing it out. And so that's kind of who we are, that's, that's, that's our journey. But what we do today really is like, we go to companies, typically we have conversations with their CEOs or CFOs and we say, well, what are the 10 things that you are either offshoring today and you're having a poor experience or what are the 10 things that you would wish to, to offshore? And then we just go down the list and we, we automate it away. And, you know, there's a lot to the product but basically at the heart of it, this is what it does. It does two different things. 
One is it can understand the document to the same degree as a human. So it can automatically read you know, something that looks like an order form. It can understand what's a customer name. It can understand what's an, what's an address. It can understand payment terms. It can take an entire table from a PDF that looks like this that you would spend you know, 20 minutes retyping. And you can just you know, put it in a spreadsheet and get a, get a result immediately. Um, so we can understand that. We can also understand any kind of special language, um, right? And so if you have price caps or renewal pricing guarantees hidden in your contracts, you usually there's a, there's a logistical challenge for you to raise prices on your customers or vice versa. If you want to understand how much more you know, spend will you have quarter over quarter or year over year, what the, what the large language model does within our product is it can read a document that looks like this, understand that this is a renewal pricing guarantee, extract that pricing guarantee, um, and then automatically calculate how much more revenue you would get up on renewal. And then we can bubble it up into an analytics dashboard and say, next quarter, you can make six more, you know, six more million dollars of revenue just by exercising uh, uh, price caps. Um, you can also automate all kinds of uh, workflows. So you can do things like, you know, you can ask questions. What are the payment terms? Um, and the trick about demoing AI is it always, you have a li little bit of lat latency because as Jim was describing, large language models take a little bit of compute and a little bit of power to run. Um, but what's pretty powerful here is like I asked about the payment terms, but it, this actually gave me not only what are the payment terms, but also the fact that there's some kind of a non-standard billing schedule, right? So it actually understands the context of what I'm asking for and it actually gives me answer even beyond like the same way a good human would. It gives you an answer beyond just the, the simple question that you're asking. You can also do things like summarize this document in an email format for my manager, Jim. Um, and so something that would take me 15 minutes going through this document, trying to you know, understand what's important, what's not important, and retyping it into a format that I can then send to Jim. Um, this does it for me in 20, 30 seconds. Um, right, it understands what's important. It understands what's important in order form rather than you know a long contract or then an invoice um, and things like that. The only tricky thing is you always need to figure out what to say while you're waiting for the response from uh, from your large language model. Good, I have a good good job filling know, that gap. That here. was good. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. I I've done this before. Yes, um, and so. You know, I think the point is, what I'm trying to say is, the way to kind of think about AI is they're both kind of autopilot and copilot modes. So there are some things where you can automate it end to end, where there's no kind of limit on that. Then there's some workflows where you still want to have that like human touch and human verification, human validation. But what Gen AI can enable you is to also be much more efficient while performing the set of uh, the set of tasks that they're actually going through, even if they're so custom of like summarizing this custom document, right? Stuff that was previously impossible. That was amazing. Thank you. I know I crunched you guys into about five minutes each and I super appreciate it. You guys could probably do a whole session on this. So I really encourage you to reach out to both uh, Kat and Andrew at their at their separate companies before I uh, bring on Cal Lai, who is an Alliance member, CEO. Um, Bring us home. Be it be our be our anchor swimmer here. Uh, thanks, Jim. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, you know, I think everything I think Jim said is right, and uh, it's really a, an exciting, revolutionary time for everyone, which I think is really exciting. And really, for me, as a you know, I'm a, a non-technical person. It's one of these things where for the the evolution is one about using GPT and some of this new AI technology to really expose the value of data. That's really the key. It's not about the technology itself. It's about the monetization uh, of data that really matters. And I think that's my major message that it's about AI. It's not about the AI, it's about the monetization of data. And what all of these new tools have done is allowed you to really show the value of the data you have. So a little context on 
uh, who I am and what I do. Uh, Aspet, the company I founded in 2014, is the world's leading uh, uh, virtual at-home care management platform, Pet Health. So I started the telehealth uh, business in the animal health space. So since our founding in 2014, we've amassed more than one and a half million recorded conversations between pet parents and our team of veterinary professionals. So we built a platform uh, that has both the enterprise as well as a direct consumer application where people can come in and through our platform, talk to veterinary professionals, whether those are veterinarians or vet techs. Uh, and I said, we have about a one and a half million recorded conversations of time we've done this. And if you think about it, recorded conversations are the perfect data for a conversational bot, which is where generative GPT is starting. Um, we've actually been applying AR to our data since 2017. So I've been working on this for quite a long time. Uh, in 2017 or 2018, we launched uh, Alexa and Google skills called my pet doc. Uh, and it was the most popular and most highly used, highly rated pet skills on both platforms. Uh, we had five categories, diarrhea, vomiting, eye, itchy, things like that, that pets have, dogs primarily. 85% you know, of the pets we have are dogs. Um, so we wanted to launch this bot. It was really well, it was heavily utilized. People really liked it. You could ask it a question through voice and it would answer the question. Uh, we abandoned it in 2018 because 2019 because it was very difficult for us to create the logic tree uh, that drove the, the, the entire engagement. Uh, so we said we knew someone was going to come along. We had been uh, you know, keeping in touch with our data scientists, keeping in touch with people at OpenEye. We worked with them pretty much this entire time. And we knew what they were developing in 2022 uh, in the form of GPT. And we said to them, we think our data is ideal for what you're doing. They agreed and they've you know, been betaing with them since that very time. So late last year, we created VERA. VERA stands for the Veterinary Engagement and Relationship Agent. It's a technology platform that's built on, originated on ChatGPT3, it's currently on GPT4. And what we've built is we built a suite of enterprise products. Think of us as uh, replacing 70 to 80% of your customer care and customer support requirements utilizing a highly informed chat agent based on all of our data. And what that does for all of the brands in the pet world is allows them to engage their customers to drive revenue retention while lowering their cost of support. So think of it in the simplest terms. There's chat GPT engine. There can be any large language model that Jim points out. Uh, that's combined now with our one and a half million consultations. We have the capability to ingest other data so our partners data into this engine to stand up a very customized bot for them. Uh, and really what that, what that says is, and I'll get into a little more detail here, we've created this very unique middleware that sits on top of GPT and in between the user. Uh, and that middleware is critical because that's where all the magic happens. So I'm gonna give you a quick demo of what we've built. So here's our homepage. Uh, as it's asvet.app. Feel free to go to it and you know, use it yourself. I think you'll be amazed with the experience. So she says, she's introduces herself. Hi, I'm Vera, highly intelligent vet bot trained by over one and a half million conversations between pet to pet parents. How can I help you? I want to get some information. So I'm going to tell them my first name is Cal. What's your email address? I'm going to say, what kind of pet are we talking about? So she's telling you she can speak in nine languages. She actually speaks in 27 different languages. So all you got to do is start typing in that language. We've had this widely tested. So you can type in German or Russian or Mandarin, whatever you want to type in. I think the only language we don't, major language we don't cover today is Hindi. Uh, what can I help you with today? My dog is scratching. And it's driving me crazy. So now she's gonna she's, she's searching our database and she's uh, our well, our database again that middleware layer is built on top of this database. So I'm sorry to uh, your dog is uncomfortable. See that's a that's a that's part of what we built into middleware called a sympathy module. As Jim said, you can give it a tone. You can tell it to be humorous or to be serious. Well, we can tell it to be empathetic, and we can in our in our middleware module we can actually dial in what that level of sympathy is. Sorry, dogs. Can you tell me a little more about the itching and scratching? For example. How is your dog itching and scratching? Where is this at? How long has it been going on? Um, scratching behind.
Hey, Cal, what tools yeah. did you use to do like from start to finish? How long did this take you just to get a prototype up just for context for the CEOs in this call? Um, did you download Llama as the open source and start with that? Or uh, we, we, had you, a, go we had ahead. a special version of GPT 3.0 that we utilized in the beginning. Um, and that was the, and we actually got this stood up uh, within seven days based on our data. So it took, again, one of the biggest challenges is uh, when you have data, you have to have, I'll, I'll get into this, information is not data. So we had conversational information, one and a half million conversations. But if you think about a conversation, hi, Cal, how are you? I'm doing fine. How are you? What well, can I help you with your dog like you're seeing here? That conversation isn't real data. So what we had to do is make sure we extracted all the things like the niceties and the pet's names, and we actually could really create real data. So we, as I said, we've been doing this since 2017. So we knew how to do that quickly. So if you know how to do that, then you can really uh, drive the conversation very easily because she has all the data there. So she's telling me about- um, To, to be clear, you didn't create any new tools. You really no. downloaded some things yeah. and then That's used correct. your That's own, correct. you have to use your own expertise. But when you right. say you translate it into languages, the large language models translated all those languages for you, right? Yeah, and what, okay. what it didn't have, and again, built into our middleware layer, is veterinary terms. So it doesn't know all the veterinary medical terms. So we had to train it up on all those. So again, all these things sit in our middleware layer. You see, the other thing that's important here is, and we, as far as we know, we're the only people who have utilized GPT in this way. We have a Vera trained to ask you questions because that because we know that as a user, you may not know the right questions to ask. So in the background, our middleware layer is asking GPT or asking our database, uh, what's the next question that should be asked based on what our veterinarians have asked in this scenario? So now she can pop up different answers. So now you can see, and you can keep going. She gives tremendously detailed answers. We have had uh, veterinarians, PhD in biological sciences, try to stump her and fool her by asking tremendously technical questions. She can respond to them. So uh, you notice the other thing here is we have a chat, but if I want to talk to a human, I can press this and it would go to one of the um, professionals on my team, whether that's a veterinarian or a licensed veterinary tech. Uh, for some of our enterprise partners, it can go to their teams and talk to them. So what you're seeing here is a, a very engaging chat agent. And it, there's been an agent and a bot as agent can uh, do things, a bot just converses. So an agent both converse and act. So Vera can actually can send you links. Uh, she can do a number of things. I'll talk, talk about that in a minute. One thing Jim wanted me to show you. So you, feel free, to, in the interest of time, feel free to go play with this yourself. I wanted to show you another thing. Uh, we're now, we're just experimenting with voice and an avatar for Vera. Today, I want to tell you about AskVet, the world's leader in virtual pet care, and how they integrated an intelligent chatbot using OpenAI GPT engine to take their service to the next level. Since 2014, AskVet has been helping pet owners keep their furry friends healthy. And now they're significantly improving their services with a new intelligent vet bot named Vera. Vera is based on ChatGPT and has been trained on all the knowledge that AskVet acquired from over 1.5 million pet parent veterinary consultations. Vera has access to a vast amount of information about animal health care and can answer many wellness questions pet parents may have. Vera provides first-level support, so if you need a fast and accurate... So you guys, you guys get the point here, I won't, I won't dwell on that. So what she's able to do is she's able to have a real conversation based on what she knows in the background. So what you just saw there was her face and her voice. Uh, this is a very valuable tool. So imagine being a veterinary clinic and in, you, know, you have a front desk today. People call that front desk. Half the time, the phone calls never get answered, uh, never get responded to because they're just busy. So what we've, we're doing is Vera now, her voice, what you just heard there, uh, can answer a phone and actually have a real conversation with you, much like she just had with you on text on our website. Yeah, well, to be so, clear, she's an avatar. She's not. That's, right. that's not. A, that's not a real person. That's not. An that's avatar. all AI generated. It's all AI generated. Yeah, got it. That's a pure avatar. So um, it's a digital human. Is what that what we call it. Uh, and she actually, if you, if you pay attention, look closely at her. She has eye movements. So she's imperfect. You see her move her shoulders. Uh, and all of that's driven based on the emotional state we create for her. So again, a, a more detailed view of what we do is uh, we have access points on the left-hand side, phone, text, an app, the web, email, any way you can communicate, we can ingest. Um, 
that all comes into our Vera agent layer where the conversation occurs. She can answer questions. She can make product recommendations. She can escalate to humans, whether that's one of our humans or a human on our partner side. Um, she then can take actions. She can help you find the right food for your dog given its condition. Uh, she can make product recommendations. She can send you a link to purchase product. Uh, if she's in a, if she's operating in a veterinary hospital, she can find your record. She can, she can do a refill for you. So all those, that seventy percent of the things people call their veterinary clinics for, we, she can handle and take it off the, the clinic. Same with the customer care operation. If you're someone like Royal Canin or Purina, your food company, um, they get these large companies get tens of thousands of phone calls every month. Uh, and we know that Vera can answer 70 to 80% of the calls, whether those are via text, or email, or voice, doesn't matter. And she can relieve the load of customer care operations throughout the industry, both for veterinary practices and for the brands that support the pet health industry. Uh, the key part of this middleware layer is our data resides there. There's a number of things like health and there's, there's tremendous information about um, prioritization, tone. One of the things about GPT that's problematic is it doesn't have a benchmark. It doesn't know what right answers are. So people always talk about how GPT hallucinates. It doesn't technically hallucinate. What it does is it has so much information, it's confused, and it doesn't know what the right information is. So in our middleware layer, we have what we call a prioritization ranking uh, layer, which always compares every response we give to what our veterinarians have said. So we always give the right answer. A, a good example is we had a, a company in the business tell us that they didn't need us because they were going to stand up their own chat GPT just by using native GPT. And we know from our research that about 25% of the time, if you say my dog's in pain, can I give it Tylenol ibuprofen? It'll say yes. Um, and that's that's fatal to your dog. So our system knows that because of the prioritization mechanism. Uh, they, these, these, these people stood, stood up their own. They tried to launch it. That was a very question that came up. Uh, someone, someone gave their dog ibuprofen. The dog died and there was true tremendous backlash because these people said, oh my God, you killed my dog. Well, that's because they launched native GPT and she doesn't know right or wrong answers. Whereas the aspect smart middleware layer does because it's all driven by our data. So the middleware layer creates insights, develops analysis that allows what we call interactive Q and A. She can ask questions back and forth. So this structure is really what's important. So it's not about the utilization of the core tool. It's about the cleansing of your data and the application of your data to really create something unique and special. And that's what's key here. So on this platform, we built two basic, three basic products, a virtual customer care software that sits in front of any brand's customer care operation. We have virtual front desk that's driven at the 30,000 veterinary hospitals that have a very inefficient or ineffective front desk today. We can replace that. And we also have virtual wellness programs where she can assist you 24 seven to do nutrition, behavior, any kind of consultation you can imagine. So really the whole point is for us to take this data and this tremendously valuable technology we built and to monetize it and allowing our partners, so you're, you're a food company, you have terabytes of data about your food. We can ingest that data and stand up a bot specifically for your brand so she can answer things. Now, one important thing we get asked all the time is, does all of our data leak out into the GPT at wild? The answer is no. All of these are built within secure silos inside of our inside of our firewall. The other thing to note about our secure firewall and our middleware layer is we provide tremendous amount of protection. We can uh, scrub you know, personal information. Uh, we can that we can make the chatbot compliant with GDPR or any other form of regulation that's out there. So building, building a product on this platform is really critical, very simple business model. It's a classic SaaS model. We charge a one-time fee to set up your customized bot. We charge a recurring monthly platform license to use this technology. And when we launch rev share programs, uh, wellness program, that's always done in a rev share. So some simple lessons from the foxhole. Data is a true asset of any organization. Um, you got to figure out what makes your data special and develop a clear use case. Jim said that earlier. There's a difference between stored information and usable data. I, I get this all the time. People say, I'm an insurance company. I got 5 million uh, pieces of paper that have, uh, you know, uh, essentially reimbursement requests, but that's not usable data. That's stored information. You got to know the difference and be able to turn one into the other. Um, AI is the tool that can expose the value of data. 
as I've been saying, middleware layer, what you would build that sits on top of GPT using your data is really critical. And that's the, the layer that really allows you to create modernization. You gotta build products on top of this layer. You gotta be clear about your, how your pr pr proprietary data can add value beyond just native GPT or Google. We actually have a rubric and we're, our system's constantly testing itself against both uh, GPT and Google to see if it delivers a better answer. Uh, our answers are always in the 90% range. Their answers are in the 10 to 15% range in terms of accuracy and completeness of response. Uh, create a secure environment so that you and your clients prepare your data doesn't leak out into the wild. You really got to partner with an AI team. So it's hard to go it alone. We have, we have our own data science team, but we've actually partnered with a third party who does um, this at a, a much greater scale than we do. And starting is extremely easy. So you can get something up, you can try it, Getting it right and making it really valuable is extremely hard. That's a good way to end. Um, hey, everyone, I know we've packed a ton in. I know we're at time. Um, but thank you all. Thank you, Kat. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Cal. And on behalf of the Alliance, thank you so much, Jim, for putting all the effort into curating this information. We will be, sometime in the coming week, we'll uh, get the uh, email out to all of you uh, with a recording as well as a slide. There's probably an order of magnitude more information in the slides that we have a chance to read everything and then the links to even more information. But putting a, a, a uh, summary together of how we should start thinking about it if we haven't already, all the different use cases and starting the conversation. And for those who are part of the Alliance, the core of the Alliance, as everybody knows, is our private groups We're behind closed doors. We can talk really openly and candidly about what we're actually doing what strategies we're employing, what's working and not working. And, and times like this is when we come together and learn faster through each other. So thank you all for coming. Uh, and from all the way from uh, Australia, New Zealand, uh, across North America. And uh, good luck, everybody. We are at an inflection point in history. So good luck to everybody. <laughs>